I'm from the Buddhist Church of San Francisco. And I am so pleased and privileged to be co-facilitating this with Reverend David Koh. Um, uh, so Koh Sensei is going to go first. And um, he's a minister of spiritual formation, discipline, um, a discipleship, and social engagement at Wesley United in San Jose. He offers Bible studies and LGBTQ issues, and engaged, um, he's engaged in homeless ministries and community development work, uh, especially with at-risk children. And I had the pleasure of attending uh, Wesley's um, uh, Reconciling Ministry service at the end of January, and it was just such a fabulous celebration of love, of community. And so I'm, I'm really pleased, uh, David Sensei and I met uh, a while back, and discussed a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today, and I was so engaged in what he was sharing with me. So I'm looking forward to welcoming him and um, enjoying his lecture. So Reverend David Coe. Thank you. Just out of curiosity, how many people identify yourself as Christians? Can you raise it? Or Buddhist? <coughs> okay. and. Other faith traditions? Or none? None? Okay, none. That's good. That's good. Okay, welcome. Just one second. Okay, so in this session, um, we're going to talk about how our, you know, the religious community has been changed, our doctrines, our perspectives on the LGBTQ issues has been changed. So I just gonna share about the Christianity part a little bit, and Reverend Elaine, we're gonna share the Buddhist part a little bit later. And then let me start with uh, my personal story, how I got involved in. You know, I'm I born and raised in a very conservative Christian community in South Korea, and to be honest with you, I had never met any LGBTQ people in my life until I moved to United States in 2006 for my graduate study in theology. So there I have no knowledge on this. And then when I went to a pretty you know, progressive seminary uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, that I met many LGBTQ seminarians and then also uh, LGBTQ professors and theologians. And that's when my struggle began. Because you know, back in, back in, you know, when I was in Korea, there was no problem because I, I, I have no idea what is LGBTQ, what kind of issue they struggle with. I always thought the Bible was very clear as opposed to the LGBTQs, so I had no problem. But as I moved to the United States, I met so many good Christian LGBTQs. And then there was a dilemma. It's, so what am I going to do? If I just accept my fellow LGBTQ you know, seminarians and professors, then I feel like I'm betraying to the gospel and I'm betraying to the Bible. So that was the dilemma. So I, was, I, I did not know what, what am I supposed to do with that. And with that unsolved you know, questions, I moved to the California and I joined the Wesley United Methodist Church. So Wesley United Methodist Church, when I joined in, was about to become a, a, about to become a reconciling community, which means an LGBTQ affirming church. So the church asked me to provide a Bible studies related to LGBTQ issues, and they asked me to provide a Bible studies, uh, you know, bring some different perspectives on how Bible actually talk about LGBTQ issues. Then. I thought, okay, I could easily provide a Bible study why LGBTQ or homosexuality is sinful and wrong because that was my background. But it was a little bit challenging to me to provide a Bible study from the opposite perspective. So I struggled a little bit. And I went to one of my pastors at Wesley who seems to know about this topic well. And I shared my struggles. Uh, pastor, you know, I have to you know, teach Bible study about LGBTQs, but I'm not sure if Bible really support the LGBTQ issues. And then after he hearing my you know, struggles, he told me that, David, when I hear you speaking about the homosexuality, it sounds like you understand homosexuality as a behavior. But when I speak about LGBTQ and homosexuality, in my perspective, homosexuality is a person a person's whole being. 
So it really shocked me at that time. And then I, to be honest with you, I couldn't quite understand what he meant at that time. But as I, you know, I studied more in depth about the Bible, and then read more books about from the different perspectives on the Bible, and now I finally understood what he meant. So at Wesley, Wesley Church became a, a LGBTQ affirming church in 2013. But after a year later, we had a celebration, one year celebration of becoming reconciling church. And after that, I felt like I'm convinced that the Bible does not condemn you know, my LGBTQ <coughs> brothers, brothers and sisters. So I want to be an ally. So I want to be a public. So after the 2014, our reconciling service, you know, we took a picture. This is all our pastors at Wesley. And I posted it on this on the Facebook. And I publicly, you know, came out as, a, as an ally. But, you know, comparing to the other LGBTQ folks and their families coming out process, this is nothing. But for me, in my world, this is a really big thing because all of my friends are conservative, very, very conservative Christians. But when I posted on this on Facebook and I become publicly said and I support LGBTQs, I lost most of my friends. <laughs> so I no longer have a people to call. <laughs> So that's very sad, but you know, I thought that's okay. I was willing to pay the price because I was finally able to see people in this, in, in this battle and the people whom God dearly loved. So that's how I got involved in. So I'm fairly new in this area. Only three years ago, I you know, became an ally. But I studied the Bible, so I can tell you a little bit of you know, what's the biblical perspective on this topic a little bit later. Okay, so uh, because the media always portrayed that you know, all the horrible Christians do the terrible things about the LGBTQs, in our mind we thought the church is way behind on this topic. But if you look at the uh, you know other Christian mainline Christian denomination, actually we has has improved quite a lot in in, in this matter. Because let me tell you a little bit about the denominational positions on LGBTQ issues. If you look at the, this you know, table, it's so all the mainline denomination in the United States. And the denominations which allows a member, a gay members, LGBTQ members, and also allow uh, LGBTQ clergy uh, in, their, in their denomination. Also the denomination support to same-sex unions and marriages. So UCC, uh, United Christ, uh, United Church of Christ, was the first denomination becoming a, a LGBTQ affirming denomination, I think in 2006. So they allow gay members, they also ordain in LGBTQ clergy, they also support in same-sex unions and marriages. And then following uh, 2009, uh, Lutheran Church became an LGBTQ affirming denomination, and the same year Episcopal Church did the same. And then recently PCUSA Presbyterian Church in the United States Becoming, becoming a LGBTQ affirming denomination. So among the main nine prote Protestant denominations, only two denominations, United Methodist Church and then Southern Baptist Convention <laughs> are not LGBTQ affirming uh, denominations. And I am belong to United Methodist Church. Uh, so we work hard. <laughs> we work hard uh, to make our denomination move forward, you know. Uh, in each denomination uh, has uh, their organizations you know, really work hard to move forward their denomination to have a better understanding on the human sexuality and also move forward in terms of the, you know, becoming an LGBTQ affirming denomination. So Presbyterian Churches has a group called More Life and United Methodist Church has a group called Reconciling Ministry Network and Baptist Church has also IWAB and Reconciling Works and the Lutheran Churches there are many, many groups. So I only know about the United Methodist Church because I'm pastor in this denomination. So uh, in our denomination, uh, we have an organization called Reconciling Ministry Networks. So maybe Reverend Easy can speak about this. If I'm wrong, just tell me, correct me. Then in the United Methodist Church, we have a little over 7 million members. Among 7 million members, we have a 30, 30, 32, 000, around 32,000 people are, you know, uh, they proclaim as they are reconciling individuals. And we have a total of 32,000 churches in the United States, and we have about 755 reconciling communities. 
So only how many percent? Two percent? Yeah, it's very mm -hmm. small. Very small. But one of the reasons that our denomination is so slow is we have uh, two uh, par uh, paragraphs, you know, really opposed to the LGBTQ uh, members, and and we oppose to the uh, you know LGBTQ clergy in our denomination. So it was re adopted in 1972 and 1984. It's almost 45 years ago, but we still hold this stance. So. Uh, next year, uh, actually this year, we have a general conference, which is a registration, a re re registration legislative body that we can change the church polity. So hopefully, I don't know, hopefully we can move forward at this time, but we're not sure. But even though we have only few reconciling communities, uh, I'm proud and I belong to Wesley United Methodist <coughs> Church. Our church is uh, one of the reconciling communities, uh, so which means we really affirming, uh, uh, welcoming all the people, regardless of their gender or sexual identity. Uh, so we welcome them as a church members and we, you know, have a faith journey together as a community. But then my question is, why is it so hard to become LGBTQ affirming churches? Why churches are having a so hard time to just support LGBTQ? That's mainly because you know, many Christians are so convinced that the Bible is opposed to the LGBTQs. That was their understanding. But is it really? Is it really Bible is against to the LGBTQs? You know, to be honest with you, the, the term homosexuality was not, did not exist in the, any kind of Bible translation until 20 centuries. Actually, the term homosexuality was first, first appeared in Germany, not in a biblical translation, but in a medical report. And then, 19, uh, 1946, the Revised Standard Version, the uh, one version of the Bible translation, first used the word homosexual in its translation. What it means, before 1946, there was no words homosexuality or homosexuals or sodomites in the biblical translation. So all the words that we now translated as a sodomite or homosexuals, in before 1946, they translated in a different words, like a male prostitute or uh, sexual misconduct with the youth. But now they all translated as a sodomite or homosexuality. So that's one, under, one issue we have. And another issue, you know, the controversy is in nowhere in the Bible Jesus ever spoke about homosexuality or human sexuality. So we don't have any clear statement from our religious leader, Jesus Christ, talk about homosexuality. So the only uh, scripture verses we have is a couple of uh, verses from the Old Testament and a couple of verses from the New Testament. So we start to speculate on what the Bible really talks about. But people translate the Bible literally from one, one in a, a verse to our context. That's always a problem. But if you're thinking about when Bible was were written, you know, most of the writings in the Bible were lit, written at least 2,000 years ago, right? or 3,000, 4,000 years ago. And their understanding on the human sexuality is very different from our understanding on human sexuality. It's like uh, you know, when biblical authors use the word universe, you know, God is in the universe. Their understanding on universe is very different from our understanding on universe. Right? So whenever they use the uh, word homosexuality, even though they use it, their understanding on such a word is very different from our understanding. Right? So that's the important part we need to we need to remember. Right. So I'm just going to give you one scripture passage as an example uh, why it is so important to understand the cultural or social context when we interpret the Bible. Okay. So there are around the seven we call the global passages in the Bible and I picked uh, uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 26, 27 because this, this uh, Paul's letter is often used to attack the LGBTQs. 
And I think people are a little bit okay with the Old Testament writings because it's very old. And there are so many bizarre things in the Old Testament. So people feel like, okay, we don't need to really follow Old Testament because nobody really following their you know, dietary rules. We all eat you know, lobsters and we all eat pigs. So why do we have to follow a certain you know, passage in the Bible in the Old Testament? But people a little bit feel like obligated to have to follow New Testament because that's Jesus' time. So I brought a, a, a Romans as, as an example. So Romans chapter 1, verse 26, 27 the Bible, uh, the Paul, wrote a letter to people in the room. Before even we just talk about the Bible, let's just think about how crazy is the idea that, let's say just I wrote a password letter to folks at Wesley, because our, our folks are so greedy on refreshments. So I just wanted to say to them, you know, hey, don't be greedy on your refreshment, just, you know, just be nice and share, you know, the, the <coughs> Don't take two plates, you know, that's unchristian, that's gross, that's, that's unethical. If, let's say if I said that to my, you know, congregation as a pastor, and then 2,000 years later, you know, when the, uh, all the human beings moved to the Mars and when they tried to establish their society, what if they apply my pastoral letter to their social and, you know, moral guidelines after 2,000 years later? You think that's crazy, right? If somebody really tried to apply my pastoral letter literally to their context 2,000 years, years later, that's crazy. But, my, but what I tried to say, maybe the concept, we, we can apply that, that. The idea, the spirit that we have to be generous, we have to take care of one another, you know, we, have to be, we shouldn't be greedy. On those kind of ideas and spiritual you know, guidelines we can apply in our, in our another context. But we can't just literally take my words, my pastoral letter, to their context. Right? But what we are doing actually with the Bible is something very similar. This is uh, Romans is a letter, Paul's letter to the congregation and, and their churches in Rome. But we take his letters literally apply in our context. Now this is as itself is very crazy. And another thing is, as I said, you know, Paul's understanding on human sexuality is very different from our understanding. Right? Because in, in back then, what he understood is as a homosexuality is just a behavior that people can make a choice. But now, if you ever pay attention to the modern scientists or psychologists, what they're saying is, you know, psychologists and then scientists says that, you know, person's human sexuality was fixed in their very early age, or even they're genetically born with that. So, the, so in our understanding of human sexuality, sexual orientation, it's not something we can just you know, pick and choose. It's, it's more like uh, you know, we're fixed or we're born with it. So just keep that in mind, and then let's read the scripture here a little bit. So Paul said to his congregation, uh, congregation in Roman, but he was very upset because people were very lustful. People, the church people in the room was very lustful. So he said, you know, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. <coughs> Even their, their women exchanged natural sexual relations, relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their errors. So with these two verses, people condemned LGBTQ. See, look at this, it's very clear. Because you gave up your natural relations and you gave up your natural sexual orientation. So you committed sins, you, you're lustful. That's their understanding, conservative Christians understand it. That's why they condemn people. But let's, let's read this scripture a little bit differently. So Paul is saying that the men or women abandon their natural sexual orientation. Okay? So the person Paul is right now is condemning is not homosexuals. I think it's heterosexual people whose natural like a sexual orientation is to female. 
Like for me, like uh, I'm a straight person, so my sexual orientation is toward to female. But I gave up my natural sexual dis uh, you know, orientation, so I want to have uh, sexual intercourse with another man. That's against my nature. That's lustful. So, what is natural? What is unnatural? If you think a little bit harder, for the heterosexuals in this context, in this letter, sexual intimacy with the members of their own gender is unnatural, lustful. That's what you know Paul is condemning right now. But if you think the you know LGBTQs who are born with a different sexual orientation, for them, sexual intimacy with their own gender is a natural and loving relationship. If a gay man tried to have a sexual intercourse with a woman, that's unnatural for the person. If the person did that, that's what the Paul is condemning right now. And that's my understanding, right? So it is so clear to me that you know, Paul is right now condemning all the heterosexuals who misuse their sexual desire for their own lustful sexual desires. But without this kind of understanding of human sexual orientation, if we only thinking about sexual orientation as a behavior, you can just point your finger to the LGBTQ community. Yeah. You made, a, you made your behavior choice. That's the wrong choice. So Paul is condemning. But now we have a deeper understanding on human sexuality. So we, we view this scripture differently. Oh, yeah, right. For the heterosexuals, yeah, in this context, they gave up their natural sexual orientation. So of course, they are lustful. But for homosexuals, yeah, having sexual intimacy with the same, same gender, that's very much natural. And then another thing is, the relationship Paul describes here is heavy with lust. So there are not relationships between consenting others who are committed to each other as faithfully and with as much integrity as any heterosexual couple. So Paul is now talking about lust, not about relationship, right? And then right after that two verses, Paul just keeps saying, like uh, he lists out all the lustful behaviors. So he pointed out, you know, you're very envious, and you do the gossips, and you're like arrogant, you're boastful, you disobey your parents. He lists out all kind of lustful human behaviors, and he's saying all of these such things deserve death. Okay? If I'm a recipient of this letter, at this point, I'm wondering, why you point out all the lustful behaviors? Who is who? Who can say that I'm not lost for? You know, I don't know about you, but I sometimes enjoy gossiping. You know, I, I you know I sometimes you know arrogant and boastful about what I did, and I there's a time I disobeyed to my parents, and and I sometimes greedy on food, especially that the last potluck lunch at our church. Then Paul, what you're trying to say in here is that you're saying I'm lost for, and you're lost for. And everybody's lustful. But why are you saying that? So if we only look at only two verses, what conservative you know, folks always use to criticize you know, LGBTQs, we thought that's everything. But if you look at a little bit of larger context of his letter, he's right now talking about all the lustful behaviors which we all are guilty. Right? And then, now, why he's telling that? So and then we go to the next chapter, and the Paul said in chapter 2, verse 1, so he said, he concludes, therefore, what he's saying, hey, you have no excuse, all of you, you're lustful, you're sinful, you committed sin one way or another to God, right? So what he's saying is, don't judge other people. When you judge others, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, are doing the very same thing. And then the verse 3, you continue. He's saying, So when you judge those who do such things and yet do, do them yourself, 
You will escape the judgment of God, or do you despise the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? So what Paul is saying here is, see, none of you are free from lust. So then why do you judge other people? Who do you think you are? God is not even judging any of those people. And God shows no forgiveness and love and kindness to them. Are you now despising God's love and forgiveness? So if you look at the larger context, what Paul is trying to say is, do not judge. But love one another and accept those people. Right? But if you pick up only two verses in the very, at the very beginning I introduced to you, it's a very different in the verses, right? So as we have a better understanding on the scripture, when we have a better understanding on human sexuality, when we apply the social cultural context in the, in the interpretation of the Bible, we have a totally different ideas what the Bible really talks about. So in my mind, these letters of the Paul does not condemn any of the homosexuals. And does his, his point is not criticizing in homosexual behaviors. For me, his, his, his point is we have to love one another if we really experience the love of God in our lives. So whenever I hear the conservative Christians talk about, hey, we have to go back to the traditional you know, marriage, the concept of the traditional marriage. But I was wondering, huh, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by you have to go back to the biblical trans, uh, traditional, uh, 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 traditional marriage? If you look at the Bible, the traditional marriage is you have a con concubine and you, you can have a polygamy or you can have, uh, you can have sex with your female slaves or male slaves. What do you mean by, by we have to go back to the Bible? You know, if we're really going back to the Bible, the biblical tra uh, traditional marriage is pretty bizarre. I don't think any of you want to go back to the, uh, the biblical you know, marriage. So, what I'm trying to say is, in the Bible, there are many uh, sexual like, uh, practices, attitudes, you know, the Bible really recommends, or the Bible really says we shouldn't do, we should do. There are many recommendations in the Bible. But we do agree with the Bible when the Bible said, hey, you shouldn't do, you shouldn't rape other people. You shouldn't do adultery. You shouldn't intercourse with animals. We agree with that. But in the, some suggestions that the Bible made, uh, that the, the scripture made, is we don't really agree with the Bible. When, when the you know, biblical author said, you, know, you shouldn't intercourse with your spouse during menstruation, okay, that's gross, so we may follow that, but you know, not, not, not because of the Bible you know, suggests that. You know, when the Bible said we use, it's better to be a celibacy, or you shouldn't be nude, you shouldn't take off your, your, you know, your shirt in, in front of the public, and you shouldn't do masturbate, you should, you should do the birth control. Uh, we don't really agree with the biblical teaching. And to be honest with you, we don't follow many of the biblical recommendations in the Bible. You know, and uh, culturally, in, at that time, a long time ago, in ancient time, you know, their society allowed uh, prostitution, polygamy, and concubine, and sex with slaves, and treatment, treating women as a property. All those recommendations were, were culturally permitted at that time. We don't follow in our time. So the truth is, whether you're a fundamentalist, or you're conservatives, or you're moderate, or you're progressive, or liberals, we all pick and choose in verses in the Bible. Everybody. None, none of people, none of Christians can say, I'm 100% follow the Bible scripture. So, if that is the case, my point is whether we should literally follow the Bible or not is not a good question. Because nobody really follows the Bible literally. So I think a better question is how we can wisely apply biblical teachings in our time, in our context. So what is the wisdom? If everybody pick and choose the Bible verses, what is the wisdom? And we believe that there are scripture passages that really express God's heart and character and timeless will for human beings. 
I think most of verses in the Bible fall in this category, like love your neighbor. It doesn't matter, you know, you're living in ancient time, you live, in, you live right now, and you live in China or Africa. You can apply this teaching to justice and, you know, be humble. Those kind of, you know, teachings we can apply. So we believe those, you know, uh, scripture verses that really express God's character and God's heart and God's love. But there's certain passages in the Bible seems like it really expresses God's will in a particular time but are no longer really binding. Especially in the, in the Israelites, you know, all the Israel men has to circumcise. And they shouldn't eat pigs, or they shouldn't eat lobsters, and they should wear certain clothes, because in their Eastern, you know, uh, Middle Eastern context at, at that time, I think that, that was a very wise decision. So we believe that there was, uh, there was God's will, and because God loves those people very much, so God gave certain rules to them, but it's really hard to apply those rules in our urban settings, right? So, okay, so there are certain verses, and there are certain scripture verses that, that never really express the heart of God, such as you, know, you have to kill a man, a woman, child in the 31 Canaanite you know, communities in the Old Testament. Or if your slave you know, be, doesn't behave well, you can just you know, beat them up with rods. So I don't think you know, th those kind of verses doesn't really in line with the God's character of love. So we don't believe that, that those scriptures really never really express God's heart. It's more like a people put it there for their own purpose. So most of the uh, controversies happening in the Christian community or this society, all the verses you know, fall into the second or third category. The verses that express God's will at one time, in a particular time, but is put, uh, no longer binding, or scripture uh, verses never really fully express the heart or character of God. Such as if you're thinking about abortion issue, you know, uh, you know, slavery issues, you know, women's rights issues, or LGBT issues, all the verses that Christians quote from the Bible are fall in the second or third categories. Then my point is, what if we focus on the Bible verses all the Christians agree on? Love your neighbor, you know. Accept the people, uh, accept the children of God as who they are. And show the, you know, the, the forgive others, one another, you know. Why we focus on all the verses we 100% agree on? If we work hard on those verses, I don't think you know, we have to have a, this kind of conversation at this point in, in, in this conference, right? So my suggestions to my fellow Christians are, let's stick to the verses, what we know well. And let's admit the Bible is not a textbook for the human sexuality. And you know, let's admit the Bible doesn't have all the answers about our social problems. But we can apply the spirit of the Bible, the love and justice spirit of the Bible in our context at any time. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so uh, Reverend Elaine Dolin is a priest at the Buddhist Center of uh, San Francisco, and he is a minister, minister, minister assistant in the her ministry includes uh, community outreach and the homeless networking and support. And she also provides pastoral care at the uh, San Francisco County Jail. And she has taught the essentials of Buddhism uh, at that, uh, you know, the San Francisco County Jail since 2008. So I only met once with the Reverend Elaine, but she, her knowledge on this topic and her passion in this area is really, really an outstanding. So let's welcome Reverend Elaine for her well, good afternoon, and thank you for coming to our faith uh, se uh, section. Um, when David Sensei and I were talking, we both were going to share a little bit about ourselves. So, um, is it on? Is that, that arrow? Yeah. yeah. There we go. So this is actually my childhood. I was raised Catholic, uh, 12 years of Catholic school, uh, 
all, all from elementary and Catholic high school. And um, I made four of the seven sacraments in Catholicism. I was baptized, confession, this is my first Holy Communion picture. And I made confirmation and it was right after, actually it was during confirmation. Um, I have amazingly open um, parents, uh, Catholic parents, and they knew, my mom said she knew from a very young age that I was gay. I knew since I was five that I was lesbian. And um, they were just always incredibly welcoming and open. And I never had to hide who I was, which was amazing. I'm 56 years old. Back then, it was really unusual. Um, and it's only as I got older that I realized how precious my childhood was in a family as, as welcoming. Um, but during confirmation, when as an adult we, we reaffirm our dedication to the tradition, I, decide, um, I was really struggling with the Catholic Church with doc three doctrines predominantly. One was um, obviously on homosexuality. The second was on um, birth control. And the third was that there were no female ministers or priests in the tradition. And so um, I told my mom I had to go, that this, I, I could no longer go to church with the family. And she said, fine, just find a faith tradition that you can cling on to or, or you serve as, uh, to guide you in life. And so, of course, I didn't. Um, I partied for a couple years. And it was in college that um, I took a comparative religion class and discovered Buddhism. And everything made sense to me. Everything, made, I felt like I came home when I, when I started studying Buddhism. Um, Buddhism is a religion based on the teachings of Siddhartha Gautama. He came to be called the Buddha, which means the awakened one, after he experienced a profound realization of the nature of life, death, and existence. And, and what really resonated for me was I could be queer and be Buddhist. So the doctrines, it, fundamental doctrine in Buddhism is of samsara, the cycle of rebirth, the process by which we create and recreate our own suffering, which is governed uh, by our actions, impermanence, all things are constantly changing. Um, and as Technohan said, it's not impermanence that makes us suffer, it's wanting things to be permanent when they're not that causes our suffering. Interdependence, this idea that we're all interconnected. Uh, this idea of no self, it's not that we don't exist, but that it's the absence of our habitual ways of thinking about ourselves. And of course, nirvana, that we could all attain per perfect peace. So far, so good as a 20-something year old uh, trying to figure out my way um, as a queer uh, individual. So the thing, when I started really looking at this idea of sexuality, homosexuality within Buddhism, so in Buddhism, they have what's called, the Buddha established the fourfold Sangha. So the fourfold Sangha is the monastics and the lay. So we have the monks, the nuns, the lay males, and the lay females, the householders. So um, for the monastics, they take a vow of cel celibacy. <coughs> so it's not an issue of homosexuality is good or bad. It's sexuality. There's no sexuality. It's celibacy. For the lay householder, we had the home dollars, we had what was called the, the five precepts. And so the Buddha said these are not commandments, they're not laws, but they're really guiding principles on our path. The Buddha called the five precepts a gift to ourselves and a gift to others. So the five precepts, avoid destroying living creatures, so refrain from killing. Avoid taking, which is not given, refrain from stealing. Avoid incorrect speech, avoid lying. Avoid sexual misconduct, I'll get to that in a sec. Avoid intoxication, which leads to carelessness because it's a lot easier to break the other precepts when I'm inebriated or, or high. So, sexual misconduct. In the sutras, which are our, our scriptures, the Pali sutras, it says, it defines what sexual misconduct is. It says, one who becomes sexually involved with those who are protected by their mothers, their fathers, or their relatives. Now, considering this was 2,000 years, 2,700 years ago, that could mean a child, or it could mean someone who hasn't been uh, an arranged marriage and hasn't been authorized by their family to have sexual relations with that person. Um, or someone protected by the Dharma, that is the monastics. That's referring to no fooling around with the monastics. And likewise, the monastics shouldn't be fooling around with you. And lastly, those with spouses. And spouses are plural because the, that was what was happening 2,000 years ago, 2,700 years ago. So if there are no doctrinal obstacles 
What are the social and political influences that are impacting our sanghas, which are our Buddhist communities? So what I did was um, look, at, look at the Asian countries where sexual activity is legal. It always begins with legal activity for us to make progress. So China, 1977, it became, homosexuality became legal. Hong Kong, 1991, Japan, 1880, Mongolia, 1961, South Korea, Cambodia, Indonesia, except for two provinces, Laos, Malaysia, females only. Uh, Philippines, Singapore, again, in, in 2007, females only, it became decri uh, decriminalized. Taiwan, Thailand, and Vietnam. Compared to the US, June, of, June 26 of 2003, that's when homosexuality became decriminalized in um, the United States when the US Supreme Court struck down a same-sex sodomy law that had been uh, raised in Texas. That's when, across the board, it became de uh, decriminalized. Um, when we look at, so once you have homosexuality not illegal in a particular country, then you can move forward with uh, same-sex marriage or union. So in Hong Kong, they have currently partnerships proposed. In Japan, partnerships in two provinces, although they're not legally uh, recognized. The Philippines, they have currently have partnership and their uh, same-sex marriage is pending. Thailand, they have par partnerships legislation proposed. Taiwan, partnership by jurisdictions, and marriage um, equality is pending. In the US, of course, we received um, our marriage equality June 27, 2015, when the US Supreme Court uh, ruled state-level bans on same-sex marriage unconstitutional and struck down DOMA as also being unconstitutional. So in these countries that, are, that don't dec decriminalize um, homosexuality, um, or where it's not criminalized, what role does Buddhist clergy play? So this is Taiwan's first same-sex marriage in 2012. So remember it was decriminalized in 1895. 2003, a legislative proposal for same-sex marriage was introduced to the um, legislator, a marriage equality amendment to constitution, uh, the constitution's pending and their same-sex um, partnership by jurisdiction. This is the first same-sex marriage. Um, it was performed in a Buddhist temple, and this is the, you see the monastic Buddha, oh, wait a minute, am I, oh, I'm one ahead. <coughs> oh, sorry, I, wrong part. okay, so this is Thailand. So Thailand, homosexual was decriminalized in 1956, same-sex marriage bill with bipartisan support pending. In the interim, Buddhist monastics offer uh, same-sex blessings. Since they can't legally marry because it's not uh, in, the, the government, in the law yet, they do provide um, blessings. This is Japan. This is, uh, in 2010, Shunkyoen Zen Temple uh, in Kyoto, Japan. Um, they started, the, the minister there, the priest started offering uh, Buddhist marriage ceremonies to same-sex couples. And I don't know if you've seen uh, Ellen Page's uh, Gaycation. First issue, the uh, first uh, um, episode featured uh, LGBTQ, LGBTQ life in Japan, and this temple was featured. Um, Japan decriminalized homosexuality in 1880. This is um, Thailand. Uh, Taiwan. So this is the first same-sex marriage in Taiwan. And you can see the, 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 all the, minister, uh, uh, the clergy in the back. Um, it was just, uh, in Taiwan, homosexuality was decriminalized in 1895. And they are so progressive on so many levels. Um, marriage equality amendment to the Constitution is in the works right now. It was first proposed in 2003. Um, and they do have same-sex uh, <coughs> partnership registration uh, by jurisdiction. This is uh, Yangon, Burma, or Rangoon. In 2014, they had their first public same-sex wedding ceremony with Buddhist and secular elements incorporated. Um, this is a significant milestone in this country where homosexuality is still outlawed. Uh, same-sex marriages have taken place before, but this was the first public one. 
uh, it's both men work for LGBTQ rights organizations, and that they had the ceremony on the 10th anniversary of their union. Um, and some of you may remember in 2000, 2013, a Burmese, a Burmese national became the first transgendered person to enter the Miss International Queen competition. There's, there's a lot going on, on despite the fact that homosexuality is still outlawed there. So this is from a, a Thai, uh, Thai activist for LGBTQ rights. She says, the problem for lesbians and gay men in our country is not one of direct state repression. Rather, it's a question of subtle negation through invisibility and a lack of social awareness about homosexual people. There's very little overt discrimination against lesbian and gay men. Nevertheless, through many, though many people acknowledge the existence of homosexuality, they're still not used to the idea of openly gay people. So this issue of subtle negation through invisibility I think has been manifested in our temples, in our Buddhist temples um, here on the mainland. Um, and it's not because our doctrine prohibits it, but because of cultural and political influences. And so our headquarter temples, the BCA Buddhist Churches of America, really has set out to open the dialogue um, for our LGB, LGBTQ uh, brothers and sisters. So these, this is a few of the things that uh, the Buddhist Churches of America has been doing. So we started marrying same-sex couples in the mid-70s. Um, in 1988, uh, the BCA makes a financial grant to Hartford Street Zen Center to help, bring, um, to help finance a hospice for AIDS patients. Um, and you know, back then, it was called the gay plague. Everyone, no one was touching it, no one was talking about it. And so the BCA really got involved. They also, um, the following year, they published What Can Shin Buddhists Do? It's a pamphlet, uh, I have a copy of it here, uh, for na a pamphlet for nationwide members, BCA members, that offered informative and exceptionally compassionate advice uh, regarding AIDS. 2004, BCA Ministers Association um, sent a formal resolution expressing their opposition to the US government's prohibition uh, to same-sex marriage. In 2013, the BCA Ministers Association sent out a formal resolution to the Boy Scouts of America, encouraging them to remove all limitations of participation <coughs> due to sexual orientation. 2013, BCA and, and their um, subgroup, the um, Center for Buddhist Education, um, published an article, Is My Sangha Inclusive, in a national, international Buddhist magazine called Buddha Dharma that asked people, that looks, it looked at ourselves and said, are we inclusive? Or is there this veil of silence in our sanghas regarding LGBTQ, despite the fact that there's no doctrinal support of this? Um, the BCA um, and the Center for Buddhist Education then began holding day-long seminars each year. So in June, to coincide also with Pride. So in June 2013, we had Over the Rainbow, the LGBTQ community in Shin Buddhism in Berkeley, a, a day-long workshop. Uh, mostly it was the first time, it was just our coming out stories to everybody. In June 2014, we held Being Gay, Being Buddhist, LGBTQ, and Shin Buddhism, also in Berkeley. Our keynote speaker was George Takei. We had uh, a whole afternoon on parenting. We had uh, Piper uh, and Louise Toyoma from uh, Hawaii uh, talking about being parents to uh, their lesbian daughter. Um, we also had uh, 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 transgendered speakers. In 2015, uh, we, are, we had it in New York City, actually. We moved it across uh, to our temple in New York. Uh, it was called Embraced by the Heart of Amida Buddha, LGBTQ, and Shin Buddhism, and we had um, uh, a Professor Jeff Wilson as our keynote speaker. Also in our BCA's uh, national monthly newsletter, The Wheel of Dharma, it, they continue to publish articles exploring and celebrating the Shin LGBTQ experience and perspective. The BCA offers LGBTQ education to its overseas ministers. So when ministers from Japan come over here and are interested in uh, maybe taking a job at one of our temples, they have to go through a program. And part of that program is myself, um, a, another queer priest, 
And um, a resident minister, my resident minister, Ron Kobana, we sit down with them and just talk about the LGBTQ issues. I give them history from a personal perspective. We talk about what it's like in our temple and what some of the, the, the cultural differences are. So our leadership, my leadership, the BCA has really stepped up, but we do need to do more. That invisibility is still a culture in our temples. And um, there was an article written uh, in 2012. It was uh, by a Professor Jeff Wilson, who was last year's keynote speaker at one of our um, lectures. He published a 30-page scholarly research study on Jodo Shin and same-sex marriages in the United States. And he documented the first Shin um, marriage uh, performed by a minister in one of our temples. Um, and he said there are two major reasons for this. The first major reason, he said, is that Shin priests, uh, their, their aversion to discrimination because they have experienced it themselves because of the camps. So when you think of 1975, still very fresh, the camp experience, right? So that was one of the reasons. They could not imagine discriminating against someone because they experienced it firsthand. The second reason was because there's no factual basis not to marry same-sex couples. This is the conclusion of uh, Professor Wilson's uh, study. To conclude, a variety of forces influencing American Shin Buddhists, including a history of cultural exclusion and governmental oppression, and internal theological elements, all combined in the 1970s to produce the world's first documented Buddhist same-sex wedding ceremonies. Since then, the number of Shin ministers performing same-sex unions and weddings has expanded dramatically, and the Buddhist churches of America and the Hompa Honganji Mission of Hawaii have become consistent supporters of marriage equality. This means that we celebrate our gains that our tradition has made. But it also means that we continue to work for greater acceptance within our communities. And like I said, there's still a lot more work that we can do. So looking at some of uh, our same-sex marriages, perhaps our most famous one that we're known for is uh, <coughs> in 2008, uh, uh, the actor Mr. Sulu, George Takei, he uh, married his um, now husband, Brad Altman, in a Jodo Shin Buddhist ceremony down in Los Angeles. This was at the Japanese American National Museum. Um, you can see Lieutenant, uh, I'm not a Trekkie, is that Uru? Uru. Uru. How do you say it? Uru. Uru. And behind her is the Jodo Shin priest that married uh, uh, George and Brad, uh, Reverend William Briones from the LA Hompa Honganji Buddhist Temple. This is our most recent. It happened last week. Um, so this is our, and some of you may know Reverend Kiyosuke Miyake. This is Reverend Miyake right up here. He, um, he, he has helped out and participate in some of these Tadaima pre-events that we've had. So he married his now husband, TJ. We see his family, Japanese family from Hiroshima Prefecture, TJ's family from Boston, and it was a great temple. Oh, we have uh, to the far left is Sister Annie from the Sister of, of Perpetual Indulgence, who gave a really beautiful blessing during the ceremony. Um, this was one thing that Kiske Sensei did was invite the entire Sangha. So one day after service, he just got up and said, I'm getting married on this date, and I'd like all of you to come. And so it became this really wonderful Sangha community celebration. And people that maybe would never have been to a same-sex marriage in their life were, were coming and celebrating. And it was such a joyous occasion. This was just last week. So here we are. <clears throat> Spirituality runs deep in all of us. And our temples and churches, they should support us, inspire us, challenge us, and welcome us home so that we can authentically say to Dharma. I have such gratitude to the BCA, Buddhist Churches of America, for their ongoing support of all things LGBTQ. They are just, just blowing my mind how open they are and quick to really embrace what's really important to me. 
And I really honor and feel privileged to be doing this type of ministry. And I'm also extremely grateful to my brothers and sisters in other faith traditions, like Reverend David and Wesley United, and the churches that are really putting themselves out there to be a reconciling ministry. Um, I think this is, this is whatever it is that we believe, it's so important that we can come home and be authentic in our spiritual home. So I, I'm so grateful to you today. And I'm so grateful to each of you for, for coming to our session. So thank you. So we're going to open it up to questions. Um, I actually have a question for David Sensei. Um, when you talk about, let's see, do we shut, how do I shut that up? <laughs> Um, you spoke about uh, one of the misconceptions I misunderstood when I attended your Reconciling Ministries uh, celebration in January, which was fabulous, was that, it, that this is just a choice that you have made but, and that you had the full support of the hierarchy. But you guys are really going out on the limb. Like you could be excommunicated, correct? Uh, maybe <laughs> Reverend Easy or Reverend John can speak more about you know what's really going on in our denomination. Yeah, you know, uh, technically speaking, yeah, pastors who ordained pastors who officiate uh, same-sex marriage can be expelled from our conference if somebody make a complaint about. So it's actually performing the marriage where it's. We are not allowed to also, uh, you know, to rent our facilities for the same-sex marriage oh. as well. So, yes, we're not allowed to do that. Wow, that's Anything that's so more amazing. you want to add, Reverend Yes? Yeah. Uh, that's pretty much. You can not be ordained if you're out right. and practicing whatever practicing means. Like, I'm an expert already. I don't need to practice. <laughs> 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 that's where we might have tried. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, but they say if you are not celebrate. You could be defrocked. I see. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's the situation, but I think many of the LGBT, you know, the reconciling communities, LGBTQ forming churches in our denomination, really feels like uh, what is the biblical obedience and what is the, you know, our obedience to God, to the Bible. So mm -hmm. how can we really faithful as a Christian? So we believe that what we're doing is the right things as, as a Christian. How long did it take you be, to make that decision to then call yourself Reconciling Ministry? Uh, we had, uh, we first formed the Reconciling Committee. So here Ernie Murata is one of the co-chair of the, our Reconciling Committee at Wesley. So it took a one year to educate our congregation. Actually, it took 13 years. 13 we years. started in 13 years. I had one night with us and we had a presentation. About oh, 13 years ago? 13 years ago. Oh, and it was a slow weird. process wow. for Wesley. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I thought we were slow in our temple. <laughs> <laughs> wow. We, we formed the reconciling committee. Well, we have one earlier. We have one earlier. Mm. 13 years ago. Okay. okay so wow. That part we had the pastoral support that we had uh, when Jeffrey Hall actually did the, uh, all the work. Mm -hmm. Any questions out there? I don't want to dominate. Yeah. This is a question mostly to you, but how do you suggest kind of, um, like for, how do you mention how like in the Buddhist doctrine, like there's nothing against LGBTQ, but how mm -hmm. like it's hard to kind of integrate that into the temple communities, especially in more conservative areas. Mm -hmm. So how do you suggest like kind of going about trying to bring up like visibility and representation and talking about like, queer people and people. Yeah, that's a good question because that is the problem, the, the invisibility of, right? Um, I, I just like to mention that it's super cool to see you as like a queer like out like PCA minister. <laughs> you know, it, and I'm not the first. And we just, uh, there's a, a minister and he and his husband just got assigned 
to a very conservative, um, but, but they knew, he put everything on the table. Conservative, fairly conservative community temple um, in Northern California. So it's, it's, we're moving in that direction. The more we talk about it, um, talk to me afterwards. We, we, we can, I think by having people come to the temple and give Dharma talks or, or give informationals, um, I'm working with the, the ministerial team to educate because a lot of our ministers aren't educated on what's appropriate. I know when ministers come to our temple, we now have a form that we, we give folks to let them know that we have a diverse um, congregation and what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's not one size fits all, but visibility is the answer, I think. As long as we stay quiet, stay hidden, that, that um, culture is going to be perpetuated. So you were working at predominantly Japanese-American congregation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So do you feel like uh, that Asian culture or Japanese-American culture is more conservative than other cultures, or do you find any difficulties? Um, so conservative is an interesting word. I think that the... Um, I, I, well, when I look at who's out in our temple, it's a, a lot of uh, the non-Japanese, the Hakujin, the Caucasian, the non-Japanese people. There's something in the culture that reinforces you have to have family, you have to get married, you have to have kids, right? It, and even when I'm talking to some of our seniors, when they're talking about their son or daughter, and they say, well, you know, who is he dating? And it's the, uh, under, uh, the um, expectation that they're all heterosexual. And so it's, um, there's just something unique about the culture that I can't really put my finger on what exactly it is. I, I, it's not conservative per se because I have never been closeted in my temple from the day I arrived. I have been nothing but welcomed with open arms. So in that respect, they're very open to me, but then I'm not their daughter, right? There's something about within the culture um, that makes it very difficult <laughs> for um, our Japanese American LGBTQ members, especially our youth, to come out. Other questions? Have you noticed, like, um, is there a difference now in terms of the the membership, uh, you seem to have more uh, you know, LGBTQ people coming to your Yeah. Yeah, we definitely, the, the membership is changing, and that's exciting. Also, I think our members are changing, because, you know, we, we were um, a contingent in Pride Parade a couple years ago. Well, we've done it for the last three years, but the first year, it just amazed me who came out. We had more allies than actually LGBTQ. And second year, we had, like, allies, LGBTQ, and their families. And, and so we just saw this... Uh, kind of a growing of appreciation. And so that's, to me, the whole thing is just to make it so that we can talk about it and not have that silence. So yeah, we're, we're getting more LGBTQ people into our temple. But I, I think we're also just getting, I don't know, what do you think, Leo? I think that we're getting uh, more people able to talk about it. We had Boy Scouts in the first time we were in, um, uh, we walked in the parade in 2013, 14, yeah, 13. Uh, we had Cub Scouts, we had girls, our Girl Scouts, so we, our temple, right, supports the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts in addition to the Youth Athletic Association and some other um, affiliate organizations. But they were wa walking with us. We had the Girl Scouts Color Guard walking with us. Um, we've had Boy Scouts. I just attended a, a board meeting a while back when um, some issues of, this, of the gender neutral restrooms were coming up. And they looked to the Boy Scout, uh, to the, the Boy Scout leader was there for some unrelated business, but they turned to him and said, so what do you think about all this and what's being proposed? And he said, you know, we look to you. We look to you for guidance on how, how we can share this with our kids, right? So I think that's so exciting that they look to our temple to set the moral compass for the Boy Scouts. And, and you know, we've been working with Boy the Boy Scouts, they do services, 
part of services and, and ceremonies in our temple, in our hondo, our temple proper. And, you know, they, they know we have a very large LGBTQ ministerial um, assistant team. And so, I, I don't know, it's, it's really beautiful for me to see the, the relationship develop and that we can influence, right? And our minister's association wrote the letter and said, this is not okay. And one of our temple members personally took it to Dallas and, and gave it to them and said, this is not okay that, that you have this ban on, on same-sex uh, on leaders and, and um, kids that are participating. I think Wesley is a similar situation too. You know, Wesley is historically Japanese-American church, so people usually come to Wesley because they have uh, some cultural you know, heritages they want to learn or associate or they just like Japanese culture. But nowadays, most of the newcomers are come to Wesley because we're reconciling community. We're LGBTQ affirming churches and they like what we're doing. So that's the big change. And I think more importantly, I think the, our old members, they, they, they came out, you know. So they never really shared that they are gays or lesbians, but now they openly share that their mm -hmm. own sexual identity and sexual orientation. And also families <coughs> share that, oh, I have, uh, you know, my family members are LGBTQs. That's, I think, the, the environmental mm -hmm. you know, change, like all the, the feeling <coughs> of the, the community is very different. I'm also part of a network on religion and justice for Asians under LGBT people, and I was talking with Ernie about the 10 years that we've been supporting Wesley in their process. So, um, so I'm so glad to see that it's now a reconciling congregation, um, and just getting speakers out there. And that's, like you said, it's about the visibility piece. Mm -hmm. um, how's it accessible to people who are non-English speaking? And so, getting DVDs out there and getting translated material to get past that language barrier, you know, in, in terms of inclusion, right? Mm -hmm. And so that itself is so valuable. And then as I'm also a member of Pine United Methodist Church, who also historically is Japanese American, and also had a Buddhist group meet there in addition to Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. So all three of these are coming together in one space, right? And that's where fellowship and bridging happens in this community, in the Boy Scouts going to the Buddhist Sangha, and then the Boy Scouts breaking up to the Christian groups, but also influencing one another. Right. So how we can come together in that interface as well, too, and also cross-culturally. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question would be, how would you, um, how would you talk with individuals in that your congregation or other um, groups that are saying, I don't understand, you know, um, why, same sex is, I don't believe that, that's not okay. How would you confront or talk to gently, in a graceful manner, those that are opposing and outrightly adamant about sexuality? Yeah, to be honest with you, I don't know really, but recently we had a newcomers and they really liked our church. And then the person came to me and gave a book about uh, you know why it's so important to provide uh, you know gender change therapies to the LGBTQ. So the book title is X Gay something like that. So when she gave that book to me, I was wondering, do you really understand where our church stands for? <laughs> do you really know that our church is reconciling community? And I had to call her you know, personally, and then just, you know I just had the personal conversation with her, but she had no idea what we're doing. Even though we, we just, you know, put our banners in front of church, we always talk about LGBTQs, but people really selectively hear what they want to hear. So she really thought our church is helping out LGBTQs become, uh, you know, normal people. In their perspective, cure LGBTQs. So totally opposite, you know, the, the, the ideas that we're having. So in that case, you know, we have to say uh, clearly that where we stand for but at the same time, wanted to give her room to, uh, to, to share her own feelings why she think it is so important to you know, against this matter. So just give us space that she can talk about, but at the same time being firm about where we're standing for. I think at this point, that's how we're dealing with you know, those individuals. Mm 
and I don't know. Um, I, I've only had a couple occasions, actually, where that has happened, and I, I've just given the person, two separate people, um, just the room to just really share about what they feel and why they feel, but also share with them my experience of being queer, and also share the doctrine of the Buddha, which there is no doctrine prohibiting homosexuality whatsoever. Um, so just really developing relationship with them so that they feel they can say what they're feeling without uh, feeling defensive. But then also, really heart to heart, it's exactly what you just said about interfaith, right? When we start making connections with people, our perceptions start changing. That's how it happens. So really just giving the people that are struggling time to process and share and validate their feelings, their feelings are their feelings. But also do some subtle um, education in there as well. So thank you for your question. By the way, after the conversation with her, she didn't leave our church. Actually, she wanted to oh, be a member of our church. But I don't, wow. know what, what, I, don't, I don't know what it means. She thinks our church is her mission field? I don't know. But anyway, she, she wants to be a member at our church. But so I thought it was very interesting. My, my family in particular, but you know, all my family live in Korea and they don't know what I'm doing. So <laughs> they have no idea what I'm doing. They, I don't think they even know what actually pastor means to them. So, you know, I've been away from my family for a long time now. So I don't have a personal connection. But most of the Korean <coughs> folks in Korea and live who, people who are living in here are very conservative. So I don't know any of you know, LGBTQ or forming Korean church in the United States. And I don't know any Korean pastors who you know, just openly say that you know, I support LGBTQs in this conference, at least in our denomination. So it's well, I think, I think we need to move on to our next uh, mm -hmm. thing. But mm -hmm. David Sensei, thank, thank you so much. And thank all of you for, for sitting in with us and uh, sharing the afternoon. So thank you. Thank you.